You may be seated. So, hello, All Saints Church. Hello. That, a little better than that. Hello, All Saints Church. Hello. Okay, so I am not a preacher, if you couldn't tell by that. Um, I know last week you listened to the chair of the Poor People's Campaign, Eddie Anderson, and the incredible Starsky Wilson, and next week you will be serenaded by Gary Hall, but this week you have me. My name is Phoebe. Um, I just last week started my senior year of high school, and you'll have to forgive me since I can't really promise you a perfect lesson wrapped up in a little bow that teaches you in three steps how to be more connected to God. I haven't read as many scholarly books in my lifetime, and so much of this sermon will be made up of my own tumultuous and confusing teenage experiences, which I'm sorry about. But then again, I want to talk about what I know, and what more do you know than yourself? I'll be honest with you, I am not okay. I am tired. I just want to curl up in my bed, in my pillow and my blanket and go to bed. I just started school, and you know, it's great. I have zero period advanced placement calculus. <laughs> yeah. So I've been having to get up pretty early every morning to finish homework and then make it to school by 7 o'clock. And then on Saturday, I had my actual job that pays me, which also requires getting up early. And then today, I had to leave my house at 6.30 in the morning, and I woke up another hour before that to get ready and practice. So yes, I am tired. But not just in a literal sense. I'm emotionally tired, too. For the past year, things have just started to wear me out. Yeah, all the regular things with boy drama and girl drama and school, but the worst part, I think, has been watching and listening to the news. Some of you might know that All Saints Youth Transformational Journey to Mexico uh, happened about two weeks ago, although it feels like it's been a lifetime. On that trip, I was able to see the wall for the first time. It was gigantic and garish, and I was so angry at it. I wanted to just tear it down. I wanted to call people in and say, welcome, we're happy to have you. It hurt to look out into that city and think that for some people, a better future is just past this giant orange keep out sign that you can't keep out of your view. I couldn't help but think, why would God, when there are so many people like me who believe in a welcoming kindness, why would God allow this hatred to be our policy? And maybe you're thinking, that's not God's fault. You'd probably be right. In the reading, God is speaking to the other gods who rule the nations, and he says that they need to do a better job. They've been defending the unjust and showing partiality to the corrupt. God tells them explicitly what they have to do, but they don't really seem to have done it. We're still divided. We still hate. We're still a world full of negativity. And negativity is a contagion, especially with my generation. We love to luxuriate in the stress and structure of school, we're conditioned to be almost sadistic in that whoever takes the most rigorous classes, whoever spends the most time in rehearsals and clubs, whoever's eye bags loom the darkest, they are rewarded with the scholarships and opportunities. And not just that, the women and the gender non-conforming people in my life I see working three times as hard just to get the same opportunities and respect as the men that inhabit the world around them. These of my friends are the most successful and oftentimes the most unhappy as well. I see this and I continue to think, why would God let this be how our kids are taught to think? I know, God's job is not to intervene, but here's the thing. God is the one who created their job. Nothing is going to get mad or fire God if they do us a little favor. Isn't that part of why we pray? 
We're hoping for an ounce of God-induced good luck. And with the world in this state, it really couldn't hurt. Just this weekend, 63 people were killed in the suicide bombing of a wedding in Afghanistan. And another African-American man by the name of Devon Bailey was shot by a police officer at the age of 19. Deportation threatens the lives and livelihoods of so many. Two years ago, there were 7,175 reported American hate crimes. Children are being separated from their families and endure unspeakable conditions at the border. And on that subject, child marriage, which requires no consent from the child, is still legal in 48 states, including this one. And there's still a 20% chance that I will be raped when I go to college next year. And then there are the deafening shots that we hear from Dayton and El Paso. Thousand Oaks, Las Vegas, Parkland, Orlando, Sandy Hook. And those are only some of the shootings that have been put on a national platform. No matter what our political beliefs may be, we can agree that death especially when it comes so early because of these man-made horrors, is an unhappy thing. Just one day after the deaths of 13 in Thousand Oaks, I met someone from that community at a conference. She was broken. Something inside of her wasn't functioning in the way that I had seen it before. I remember her having to apologize for her shakiness because she had left her hometown alone the rest of the group didn't want to make the journey. Shootings incur more than a simply a number of dead and injured. They spread depression, fear, pain, and a deadly hatred and divide to everyone who hears the stories, and much worse to those who see the act of violence themselves. Why would any benevolent being allow something so awful and toxic to plant itself in our human network? Death itself, though, is easy to become conditioned to. I thought that I was, but then it happened to someone I knew when they were only in their sophomore year of high school. And that's when I really started to question. Thoughts and prayers really weren't enough. It didn't matter how much the community asked their respective higher powers for salvation. It didn't matter how much we hoped. Someone young and beautiful was gone. They never got to grow up. They never became a teacher or an author or an actor. They never got to be a part of the advanced theater class that they were really excited to be a part of. They were just gone. Hundreds of billions of people have met the same fate. They will never get another chance to hug their mentors or laugh with their friends. Every person in the human race has already or eventually will die. But it doesn't make it feel any less dire. It still hurts every time. So we become world weary. And I know that I'm not the only person that asks why. Why would some being titled the almighty, the all-powerful, the ubiquitous God allow this to be the state of our world? Why, in God's plan, is there so much pain and so much anger? I was brought up here learning that God is love, that we exist to be wrapped up in this love and that in the end it will save us. But with every day that passes, it becomes more and more difficult to believe that that is true. The negativity keeps spreading. In the gospel today, Jesus says that he will bring division. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He calls us hypocrites and says that we cannot interpret the current time. Well, what if I don't want to? What if all I want is for this to stop? No more tests or trials. What if for just one moment, I just want to be happy? For so long, I told myself that that was impossible. That happiness would only ever come for a small moment of time. And it would never be worth the negativity that plagues our mundane lives. But in the past year, my lows have taught me something too. There's a wonderful short film 
by a man named Bertie Gilbert, lovingly named Let It Be, after the Beatles song. Towards the, end of the, towards the end of the film, there's a quote that has recently made me think. He says, death is a necessary evil. It needs to be faced. If we don't factor it into everything we do, nothing carries weight. We're aimless. Death is a necessary evil. If no one died and everyone stayed the same forever, we would never have a chance to grow. Nothing you did would matter. Nothing you said would be important. Sure, you wouldn't be as sad, but you wouldn't be as happy either. What I'm trying to say is that your emotions are a spectrum. Without the sadness and the loss, you couldn't have or at least appreciate your happy days. When, you're experience, when you experience intense emotion, it means that the positive emotion in the future will feel even kinder and that your spectrum has expanded in both directions. We need to have our bad times so that we can get to our good. Death is a necessary evil. It needs to be faced. If we hide from the reality of death and pain, we will never have the ability to change a situation in the future. We have to face the idea of death head on with sadness, but also its companion determination. My friend from the community of Thousand Oaks, yeah, she was sad, but she worked to make things better. She ended up organizing a women's march for our youth she spoke to thousands about the importance of intersectionality. She then led 600 Californian youth in a conversation about gun, gun violence and the hate that it spreads. There is something that you can do. Spread love, be kind, stand up to the hurt and pain and don't accept it as the end because you can make things better. Death is a necessary evil. It needs to be faced. If we don't factor it into everything we do, nothing carries weight. Without death, you wouldn't remember the good. You wouldn't hold on to your hope. Whenever someone that you love dies, your fondest memories of them are immortalized in your mind because death made them important. It helped them to be cherished. Death is a necessary evil. It has to be faced. If we don't factor it into everything we do, nothing carries weight. We're aimless. I'm not okay. And that's okay. I don't think I will ever be able to fully understand why these things happen to us. But moving forward in the knowledge that it's okay to be sad, and in the words of wonderful parishioner Claudia Shields, it's appropriate. That helps me to breathe through tough times. But we have to face them too. We have to allow the tears to reach our shoulders and then we have to do what we can with love. Because we are not aimless. We are human. And there is nothing more human than love. Amen.